Okay. So today is February 12th, 2014. Um, I am interviewing Scott Kidd, who served in the United States Navy. Um, my name is Mark Barnes, and with me is Fernando Malinado, who is working the camera. We are interviewing Mr. Kidd as part of the UCF Community Veterans History Project and as research for the creation of the Lone Sailor Memorial Project. Uh, we are recording this interview at UCF in the city of Orlando, Florida. Mr. Kidd, or Scott, however would you like Scott to address you? Scott, um, so if you could just give us some of your um, early biography, where were you born, your brothers, sisters, mother, father? Sure. I was born in Richland, Washington. Um, I have six brothers and sisters, uh, single parent family, um, raised there uh, in the 60s, uh, left home when I was 15. Uh, as part of the late 60s, early 70s, uh, liberal generation movement. Um, uh, early in the, uh, bounced around the California, Las Vegas area, got married, uh, decided I would join the military and clean my act up at a certain point uh, in life, and uh, then spent uh, 12 years in the service. Uh, I, uh, after multiple experiences there, I received a medical retirement uh, due to some contamination from a uh, command I was with, and uh, moved on into real life. Uh, opened a couple of businesses, got into broadcasting. Uh, now uh, the uh, uh, I run a company that is involved in uh, putting uh, science and technology companies together with young students in order to do career guidance. Very good. And um, uh, what year did you join the Navy and what were your reasons for choosing the Navy over other service branches? I joined the Navy in actually February of, yeah, February of 1983. And uh, at that time, uh, we were busy, the United States in particular was busy enjoying a massive recession, um, huge unemployment, uh, 18, 18 to 20 percent interest rates on home loans. Um, there was a, a lot of convulsions there and I had a, a young family that I needed you know, to be able to take care of. So like many people, I joined for the job. Uh, I selected the military because quite frank, I selected the Navy because they gave me a bonus which came in quite handy at the time. So, like many people in the military who joined, it was for the money, for the job. And what, what, were, um, what were some of your first experiences um, coming out of boot camp, your, some of your first assignments? Okay, uh, here's a little entertainment. Uh, first place, um, I was, even though I was born in, in Washington, I soon made my way to warmer climes like the LA and Las Vegas areas. When I joined the service in February of 1983, the Navy in its infinite wisdom sent me to Great Lakes, Illinois, which is the north end of Chicago, directly on the lake. Now, for those of you unaware of it, it's freaking cold up there. <laughs> so uh, when you have a chill factor of minus 35, it uh, persuades you that it gives you second thoughts about your, <laughs> your move to join the military. But at any rate, I completed boot camp there and, that was, and my initial training, I was actually there for the best part of a year. Uh, and my first duty assignment was in Norfolk, Virginia uh, with a, a ship called the USS Shenandoah. I forgot to mention it down there. Brand new ship that had just been commissioned. I was what was known as a boiler technician. Uh, I was persuaded to become a boiler technician because the recruiter I spoke to was a chief boiler technician who told me what a great job it was. And oh, he lied. <laughs> uh, I will tell you, this is not just for me, but through uh, uh, your conversations with anyone else in here, one of the most common refrains you will hear from folks who served in, the, in any of the branches is that my recruiter lied to me. <laughs> that is just... It's all, it should be on Hallmark cards. <laughs> but regardless, um, uh, 
when I started uh, on board the Shenandoah, which was a, a tender ship. In other words, it was a uh, a repair ship, sailed around to brought supplies and performed repairs on other ships while they were deployed. So we would accompany uh, battle groups of ships that uh, would go on cruises. Uh, for example, a Mediterranean cruise would normally be scheduled to last for about six months. It would include an aircraft carrier, some destroyers, support ships, this and that, and we would, we're the type of ship that would go along with that group in order to keep them functioning over that six month period. So my job was to work on propulsion stuff, which is what boilers were for, and then we built steam. Uh, interesting experience, it was also one of the first uh, ships in, in the Navy that had a sexually integrated crew. Uh, because we, at that time, uh, women were not permitted in, contact, in, in combat roles because this particular ship was considered a uh, support ship. It was, did not put anybody in direct combat. Ergo, you could have women sailors. What year was that? Was, that was 1984. What... Uh, <laughs> What, when, when did you come to NTC Orlando? I was stationed at, starting in June of 1989. It was uh, what's called my first shore duty command, which meant that I did not have to go to sea for a while. And how did you come about getting that assignment? Um, uh, my assignment at NTC Orlando was actually with the subcommand RTC Orlando, Recruit Training Command. Uh, this is kind of uh, important, uh, an important distinction in that, uh, as background, uh, if uh, in, in order to get promoted in the military, uh, you had to show your skill and availability and flexibility in different types of roles. Uh, those roles would usually include assignments. Now, there were certain assignments that you could take in the Navy that enhanced your resume and virtually guaranteed your promotion to the next level. Um, uh, for enlisted people, uh, promotion uh, E1 through E6 is essentially strictly a test taking uh, job. The Navy says how many it needs, you take a paper test, and if you score high enough on that test, you get promoted. The promotion to E7 the E7 through E9 grades, which is senior enlisted, is, uh, is based on different criteria. Uh, along with taking tests, it's also a lot of interview, examination, your service record, what type of assignments you've had, skill sets, et cetera, performance based. So if you wanted to be promoted to E7, which was kind of important for a number of reasons, you had to take some demanding assignments. RTC Orlando recruit being a recruit a recruit company commander slot there was one of those type of assignments that would get you if you completed it successfully odds are you were going to get promoted. So you arrived in 1989 to. I was there NTC. through through 1980 or from 89 through 93. And what were your impressions of the? base and or the Orlando area when you arrived? Oh, Orlando is beautiful compared to Norfolk. <laughs> um, the, uh, the base had, was a mixture of buildings that were 60 years old and brand new. Um, from uh, The base, of course, was originally an Army, was an Air, Army Air Force base built back in World War II. And it had been in the 1960s supposed to be closed, but Lyndon Johnson did a deal with one of the uh, uh, Congress people here for Central Florida uh, in order to get the congressman's votes for the Civil Rights Act. Uh, Lyndon Johnson did a deal with them, said, well, we'll keep the base open instead of closing it so you have jobs, and they transferred it over to the Navy. The Navy, you might note that we li do live in Florida, and that Orlando is damn near as far from the water as you can get. So that might seem an odd place for a Navy base. 
But at any rate, that's why it was there. But it was a beautiful base, and the city of Orlando, of course, was growing uh, at that time. Lots of great building going on, lots of energy, sunshine, all the things you might expect. So while you were at, while, while you were at um, RTC, what were your uh, responsibilities, your day-in, day-out responsibilities? <coughs> I was what is known as a recruit company commander. Uh, many people recognize that from what they are in the other services called drill sergeants. But the Navy being different, they were recruit company commanders. It was our job to supervise uh, folks who were brand new to the military experience, Navy in particular, uh, from the, the time uh, they arrived on a bus until they had met certain standards and were prepared to go on to their first set of actual technical schools. We trained them in how to wear uniforms, appropriate sense of discipline, uh, how to recognize military rank, uh, appropriate forms of behavior. Um, the, uh, the, the recruit training experience is something that's been around since Roman times. It is designed to take someone who is a civilian with civilian values, regardless of where they come from, and first uh, break down their identity as a civilian uh, for who they were in the first place, and then build them back up with a new identity, sense of recognition as a member of that military group. Uh, so that is what, that's what we did. Over the course of eight weeks, we would spend a couple of weeks uh, um, being very nitpicky about any any deviation from standards uh, by the quarter inch, sometimes sixteenth of an inch. Uh, once you did that, uh, normally that normally took about two weeks, and from that point on, you would spend your time having them involved in basic classes classroom activities and then uh, participation in group activities in order to build up that identity. And, and how did the recruits, obviously they may have been different, but how did the recruits seem to react to the environment, to the training, to the region? They came in raw and, and left as? Left as sailors, which is what they were. Uh, uh, such a wide range, it is. Uh, when you say how they reacted when they came in, that's kind of the point. The point is you do have a wide range of individuals. And uh, the, the point is to put them out at the end of that eight-week training as similarly as possible. So they all met certain standards. So we really didn't care how they felt when they got there. We already knew uh, that the system was designed to be uncomfortable for them. It was designed to be challenging. An example is routinely you would, uh, the, their first day of arrival, regardless, uh, uh, they would be scheduled to come in somewhere between 10 o'clock at night and 4 o'clock in the morning. They would be herded into a, basically a dormitory room with bunk beds, regardless of what time they got there, uh, with their stuff whatever they carried along, which was minimal in their clothing, at uh, 0400 or 4 o'clock in the morning, myself and another person would come in and wake them up. It was not unusual for us to wake them up by banging trash can, metal trash cans or using an air horn or both. Uh, the idea was, think of it as shock and awe. Uh, because they would leave for the next couple of weeks, basically 18-hour days, in order to, as part of that process, to change their value system. Um, now, did you guys, now you as a as a instructor, and you can answer for the recruits if you know as well. Did um, did you guys have normal off-base activities, uh, downtime? Anything that you guys like to do? The recruits did not. Recruits. During that eight-week training, uh, let me rephrase that. During the eight-week training period, 
the recruits would normally go through six weeks, <coughs> six weeks of training of varying intensity. In, uh, initially extremely intense, a little less so and more cerebral as it went along, more detail oriented. Uh, by the end of six weeks, uh, normally somewhere the sixth to seventh weekend they were there, they would be escorted by company commanders like me to some type of off-base activity, go to SeaWorld or something else along that line. The following week they'd be allowed to go without escorts. But that weekend, when they graduated, which was either the, normally the end of their seventh week, when they graduated, they would have that evening to go out and do whatever they were, then they would come back, they'd have two or three more days before they actually left the base and went on to their next command. Depends on the schedule of the, the way it fell apart. So uh, by and large, the, the company commanders, no, we, the company commanders were horribly mistreated. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was one. Uh, it was a very challenging duty for company commanders. Um, because uh, in, the, uh, in the shipboard Navy, normally you deploy for six months. You're gone from home, family, all the rest of that. The boat's gone. Uh, and you'd go for shorter deployments. Uh, depending on what type of command you were on, it was nothing for shipboard Navy to be gone physically nine months a year from your home and family. Very strenuous there. Well, when you came to a training command here, it was just as bad. The problem was it was even more intense. And worse, your family was just down the street from wherever you lived. So um, when, when we say that it was intense for the recruits, understand that the company commanders did everything the recruits did, were with them that entire time, plus an hour before and an hour after. So it was not unusual for company commanders to have weeks where they averaged four hours sleep a night. You know, after after uh, three consecutive, uh, the normal schedule was to train three companies and then take a break from, from being a company commander to being an instructor and teaching classes, which was normal life. You actually had like weekends off and that sort of thing. But for six months, you were, you were pretty burned out. <laughs> uh, the the effect on company commanders of being stationed there, the normal uh, billeting there was a three-year duty. Uh, uh, when you got orders to go there, you were expected to be there for three years. And uh, the divorce rate there for married couples was in excess of 70%. Uh, it was just that strenuous and demanding a duty. It was, it was pretty intense. But for those people that survived it and did well, God bless them all. So you mentioned uh, classes that recruits went to. What, what were some of the classes that they, they uh, Recruits would go through classes, everything from uh, an introduction to naval history, uh, teaching them about John Paul Jones, and you know, uh, it was very much a, a very light overview, very light, uh, of uh, the years the military the years the Navy got started, some of the high points in very early uh, naval history, et cetera, that type of thing. Uh, they would also uh, go through courses, classes on basic hygiene, um, behavioral sense, uh, 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 we'll call it social and ethical education, as in teaching them what the standards were, uh, we had class everything from naval history to rape awareness, uh, all of which were taught by certified instructors like myself. Uh, so uh, uh, everything from how to wear your clothes properly to the language of the Navy, as in, uh, for example, what a bulkhead is. It's a wall, by the way, if you didn't know. Uh, all floors are decks, ceilings are overheads. Uh, there's a shipboard terminology that the Navy uses that no one else does. So you had to learn that. You also had to learn neat stuff like bits and bytes as they apply to the Navy. They have nothing to do with high tech. 
they have a whole lot to do with ropes. <laughs> so these, these are all things that, uh, you know, uh, there's a wide range of topics largely related to how to behave in a shipboard environment. Now, did you instruct uh, male and female recruits? Oh, yes, I did. <laughs> so, so what was that experience uh, like for the recruits, for the officers? For, for the, re let me start with for the recruits because I got a lot of feedback from them. Uh, this was a unique time in the Navy's history, uh, my particular time there, because of uh, the fact that uh, while Recruit Training Center Orlando had always, as long as the Navy had been accepting women, had been the training center for women enlisted recruits. Uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, the Navy as a policy made the commitment to do uh, uh, training of both sexes together in the same room, no separation, this and that, and the other thing. The Navy was very, very concerned from a policy matter that uh, the, there would be problems involving throwing a lot of young people together in a stressed environment where they might be encouraged to look for some release from that stress. What a stunning idea. <laughs> so, uh, in the Navy's infinite wisdom, uh, they made it the responsibility of the trainers and stuff to emphasize to these young men and young women every day that having sex was not a good thing. So, it was a response. so you, you might want to imagine telling a drunk, don't think about pink elephants. So, yes, it, uh, it became challenging in that respect. And young women and young men being what young women and young men are, there were some rather creative attempts to get around the rules there. Not a big deal. Uh, in the big scheme of things, it's hardly, but it was more amusing than anything else. Uh, the point was that it added a note to the training environment that didn't exist elsewise in the Navy. Um, and it also led to some major changes in the way recruits were actually trained. Um, the history of, of training recruits is replete, whether, regardless of branch of service, again, is very much tied into the process of breaking down the individual identity in the first place and rebuilding it. Anyone who's ever watched the movies knows that there's a certain amount of blunt language that is used and historically has been used. Well, the United States Navy and its training command decided that that type of language was no longer to be used. So within an environment where you have certain expectations by many of the recruits come in expecting that this is going to be the toughest thing they ever did, some of them were a little disappointed. Uh, probably a minority, but nonetheless, you had folks that were very highly motivated to be there looking for the challenge of a lifetime. You also had a lot of recruits who came to the military simply because they were looking for direction. They, that was their number one reason for, for entering. It wasn't because of job, it was because they wanted a sense of who they were within a larger community. And I cannot count the number of kids who, and I'll say kids because I was in my mid-30s and most of them were in their teens, who came to me after the, upon completion of training or during it uh, about and expressed their pride in being part of the organization, knowing what they were doing, having goals that were clear to them at that time. So by and large for the vast majority of recruits coming through, uh, boot camp, RTC Orlando, was a very positive experience. I think most of them, I, I've never met one who afterwards, and many of them, many of the, the kids I trained here even 20 years later, are in touch with me via fe Facebook or something else, who haven't expressed what a positive impact the experience had on their lives. 
funniest thing I ever saw, I actually had probably over the course of my three and a half years, 13 companies that I pushed, which was pretty much the record. Uh, more than once at the end of the training cycle for the kids, the eight week period, when they approach their graduation, uh, the, the, the night before their actual graduation ceremony, their parents and families would come to visit. It was a deal. And more than once I had some young man come introduce me to his single mother uh, and then come to me afterwards to say, I wish I had a dad like you which was a little scary <laughs> when you think of all the horrible things I'd said to that boy not two months before then. But that gives you an idea of how many of them looked at the experience. It was something to go through. It was finite. They did it. They knew they were changed. For, the, you know, for us, as the trainers, uh, the vast majority of us were already set in our career goals. We already knew where we were headed. So it was a job to be done. Most of us took a great deal of pride in the job. Uh, sometimes it was challenging. By and large, uh, and I can say this from my own experiences, and I stay in touch with five or six folks from those times, um, everyone shares relatively similar experiences of both uh, the joys and the frustrations. So, well, it's a job. Uh, well, there's two features of the base so we, we just want to kind of get your feedback on and then you can let us know how they relate either to the base or to what you did. So that would be the Blue Jacket, USS Blue Jacket. Right. And then the Grinder. Which is, <laughs> so give us your take on those two. almost forgotten about that being it's called the Grinder. <laughs> the USS Blue Jacket was, at the time I was there, uh, pretty much an unused reminder, uh, mainly because uh, by 1989, it had been there for 30 odd years, it was broken down, unsafe, never went on board it, never took recruits on board it, uh, because it would have cost money to fix, and that's not what money got put into. But it was a little bit of humor for all of us there because the Blue Jacket was physically located at one end of the grinder. The grinder was, a think of a huge patio space, uh, uh, cement, you name it. But it was located there, you could see it, and uh, there was nothing to march around it or run around it, as the case may be. Uh, and there were people from uh, the base maintenance crews who had the job of keeping it painted and all the rest of that. But other than that, it really did not have, while I was there and subsequent, because the base closed two years after I left, three years after I left, uh, that really was nothing more than an ornament. Before that, I, I understood they used to do some facsimile training on board, simply to say, this is a boat, this is a rope, this is a gangway, this is a flag or a pennant. <laughs> and that's fine, you need those things but it was not used for that in my time. Now the grinder, on the other hand, um, one of the primary tools of training uh, for all of the boot camps, all the services boot camps, but particularly here, is marching. Marching means that you get a group of people together, you teach them to march in step as one, their arms and legs moving at the same, each left arm, left leg, everything moving at the same time, to a certain rhythm, dressed a certain way, um, and the grinder was where you taught them to do that. And you yelled at them a lot, and you, you know, played music, loud music, loud martial music in a lot of cases. In other cases, you play some serious four-beat rock and roll, because it all has the same beat if you could get them to march to it. Um, the fun I won't say fun, but uh, because it certainly wasn't for them. <laughs> After the first six hours, uh, if you're out in the middle of the sun, it's far less entertaining than you might think. But uh, this is Orlando. It gets hot here. Certain times of the year, you'd be out on the grinder. You had companies that were out on the grinder every day, or at least in the evening, 
for two or three hours at a time. At other times of the year, when uh, heat and humidity didn't allow for it because of heat stress factors, you had companies that never did not spend a single day on the grinder simply because the physical requirements of such wouldn't they weren't allowed to. Uh, they may have gone through basic swim instruction at some point where they had to cross the grinder to get to the training facility, but other than that, they simply never saw it which made a challenge for company commanders like me who had to teach them how to march. That's <laughs> where, oh, okay. So, uh, uh, but you would also use the grinder as a, let's call it a training tool. As in, uh, the companies would be in their particular barracks. And uh, as a company commander, perhaps you were dissatisfied for some reason with the level of performance or morale or whatever other particular instance. So you might send your people out the back door, out onto the grinder, and have them run around the grinder you know, at sometimes two, three times, and then report back in and Whoa, one day anybody that fell behind. Uh, they, you know, so you could use those as disciplinary. Things, but. So were there any other structures on the base that either you remember vividly that you used a lot or that the recruits may have remembered vividly because they trained a lot? Well, um, of course, the classroom building, which I believe is still there. Uh, but uh, you had the... Uh, other than the cafeteria, uh, which, of course, was the primary spot for all the recruits, um, you had the firefighting command, you had the what's called WSPT, uh, which was, uh, I hate to say, water sports, water systems, and physical training, which was the gymnasium and pool. Uh, those are pretty much what the recruits saw for those eight weeks. They simply did not spend that much time unsupervised or as individuals. They just weren't given it. Once they left that, that recruit training command portion of things, there was a lot of the base to be seen, but they were not allowed to do that while they were recruits. Now, did you ever spend any time on NTC as a non-recruit commander? Yes. And what, what did you do in that? I taught at nuclear power school. Okay. I taught remedial mathematics and neat stuff like that for uh, kids who had, or for young men, it was always young men, uh, who had uh, signed up to go into nuclear power training. It was uh, very high-end stuff for them. Some of them needed refreshers on their their math in order to be able to handle the theoretical stuff in there. But that was just like being a classroom teacher anywhere. Normal eight to five working hours, Monday through Friday. Now at the time, was, was that the only nuclear training facility in the... It was the country? initial. The, the only, initial. The, the training pipe, uh, I'm going to use the word pipeline, which many people recognize as in like there's varying points along there. Uh, in, in the military in particular, uh, there's always ongoing training, regardless of what you're in. Recruit training is simply the very beginning of the pipeline. From that point on, regardless whether you're going to be a... Uh, if you're planning on just going out as an E1 to, to a ship someplace, congratulations, you're gone. You are a uh, seaman apprentice or seaman recruit is what an E1 is. You are going to go through a break, uh, additional training just to teach you what a boat's all about. That's called apprentice training, and that was also at Naval Training Center. It was separate from recruit training. Uh, for more technical schools, then there was various pipelines. For example, nuclear power, which was one of the most restricted, qual restrictive qualifications. Um, for someone to get into it, they had to, well, of course, they had to be a high school graduate. 
but on top of that, they had to have certain scores on Navy-wide entrance tests when they came in, um, certain behavioral records, et cetera. Uh, we used to go by what we called uh, uh, AFQT scores. AFQT is Armed Forces Qualifying Test, and it was scored on a 0 to 99 basis. You could not be accepted in the nuclear power program unless you scored above 90 on that test. And trust me, there were a lot of people who didn't. I trained recruits that were as low as 13. You can imagine the level of literacy for those folks. Um, so, but at any rate, you also had uh, initial training for electronic weaponry, uh, electronic, uh, you had training for folks going into uh, basic seamanship like bosun's mate school, uh, a variety of things took place on the Naval Training Center Command. These are all initial and secondary schools prior to sending someone out as qualified in that particular field to a command. And some of them might move on to a different training command when you, uh, when you spoke about the, uh, the nuclear power training command. It, about a two, at, at that time, it took roughly two and a half years from the time someone came in as a recruit till the time they actually went to a command to be around, you know, to a seagoing command that had a nuclear reactor on it. So some of the training was intense. So, and you were um, at the base of the infancy of the simulator training? Did that, was that beginning to develop? Or yes, it was. Uh, first off, all military training for years has been their simulation involved. Um, as, uh, you need to understand what simulation is, of course. Uh, not all of it's high-tech electronic gizmo game. Um, and that's, you mentioned earlier, the Blue Jacket was a stab at simulating seagoing environment. Um, many of the uh, uh, well, for example, I'll, I'll give the example of firefighting school is probably the single best example. Uh, oh, I almost forgot, because you asked earlier you asked about uh, uh, one that the recruits would remember. They all remembered the tear gas chamber. All of them. And that is another example of simulation. Because, uh, 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 well, for firefighting, of course, you would walk people through and train them in class about the basics of actual firefighting skills. Then uh, you would walk them through donning the shipboard firefighting gear, boots, heavy jackets, face masks, oxygen breathing apparatus, this and that and the other thing, put them on fire hoses, put them into a building and light control fires. Then uh, have trained groups operate the hoses in order to, to work those. Firefighting is a major, major skill that is consistently trained on, on board ships all the time for the obvious reason that you don't call a fire department in the middle of the ocean. So <laughs> that's kind of, so when you talk simulation, uh, obviously uh, there's varying levels of simulation, varying degrees of realism, but the more realistic you can make the the training, the more effective it was. Does that answer that question for you? That does, thank you. Um, so when you left, you left in 1993? Yes. Was that your final year in the Navy or did you have another assignment? Oh no, uh, from there I went out to uh, Guam. Uh, I uh, was attached originally to a ship that was getting ready to be decommissioned. Uh, the refrigerator services ship uh, that was being decommissioned. A uh, ton of fun. The ship was already 40 years old. And if you can imagine driving a car that's 40 years old now, <laughs> drive a ship that's 40 years old. It's got a few miles on it. But uh, uh, one of the problems with a ship that's 40 years old is that it's got a lot of things on there that were older than 40 years old including asbestos and this and that and the other thing, some of which I was part and parcel of discovering. So uh, subsequent to that, I thought it was time to stop being Navy. 
then the Navy agreed with me. <laughs> but fortunately, it hasn't, hasn't killed me yet. So now, did you return to this area immediately I, after the no. Navy, or you just settled here? I, um, about two years later, I returned here. I owned a home here that I'd bought. The fact of the matter is that Central Florida is a beautiful place in comparison to a lot of other places. Uh, Orlando was a medium-sized city, uh, so it didn't have quite the problems of uh, the D.C. area or San Diego or some of the other places I'd lived at. The sun always shone, and I had this odd thing about I was going to learn to play golf. That lasted about two days. <laughs> I can help you with that if you decide to change your mind. So. <laughs> um, so, what were your initial thoughts when you heard the NTC Orlando was closing? I wasn't concerned about it at all. No. Um, largely because, for me, uh, my experiences in the in, in the Navy were pretty broad. Um, while many people. If, if you were career Navy and worked all the way through retirement, which would be 20 years at least, uh, you were stationed at multiple commands, lots of them. And that meant that things came and went, people you knew, people that you were intense, great friends with for a short period of time or you lost track of shortly thereafter simply because you were separated. So uh, losing Naval Training Center Orlando, largely because it wasn't on the, on the ocean anywhere. It was just a set of buildings. It really wasn't a whole lot different than any other set of buildings any other place. Um, and of course the Navy did not get rid of recruit training. They simply consolidated it all up in Michigan or Illinois. Right? So uh, it was never about the location, it was all about the process. So do you think the Navy, uh, well, what do you think is the Navy's legacy in, to the Central Florida region? A lot of folks are unaware that Central Florida is the location of the second largest group of retired military, military retirees in the nation. It tends to concentrate a lot of people here. Uh, the fact that we had the the Navy base here for so long is really a very vital part of that. Um, and those retirees have a very strong commitment to the values they were trained in and they they live in, and work with those every day. They bring that as part of the the palette of colors that is here in Central Florida. Um, people who have a strong memory of learning about uh, uh, responsibility, decency, reliability, ethics in general, uh, and that shared commitment, those shared values. They live here and there's a lot of them. So the effect of that command that physical base and the people who work there is something that'll, that doesn't only exist now, but it's going to echo for quite a while. Uh, that uh, is something that the Orlando and Central Florida community should be very proud of, and they should recognize that that contribution, while, again, because we're not located on the water, people don't necessarily grasp, but for the number of retirees here who came specifically because, either returned because of that or came because there was that presence here, the impact is, is really almost immeasurable. So as a, as a former recruit commander, or as a former recruit, why do you think somebody would want to come back well, what do you think somebody would want to see or be reminded of if they came and visited the uh, Lone Sailor Memorial? Being, first place, there's, there's several Lone Sailor monuments throughout the nation, and this is a great loca location for them. And in the public mind, 
uh, whether you've been in the service or not, uh, that image is rather striking. It implies a lot of things. For the people who served, the people who were Navy and went through basic training, regardless of where they went, but specifically here in Orlando, it reminds them of a dramatic change in their lives where they took control of themselves and their destiny. They made that choice to say, I don't want to do what I was doing, I'm going to be different. And uh, they learned a new value system. They learned to become a part of a generations old organization uh, that had a history that they could be proud of and that they could carry with them and that they could then share with their own friends, children, subsequent generations. It means a lot. It means a lot to a lot of people and uh, uh, far more than just movies that no longer get watched. <laughs> um, the, the fact that we trained a lot of people, we sent a lot of people out to represent and defend the nation. Uh, some did not come back. Needs to be remembered. We need to be reminded of why that happened, what those values were, and why they're still important. Well, very good. Is there anything I missed that you uh, think would be relevant either to um, the project or to your? I I appreciate that y'all took time to ask me the questions. Um, the no, I think we pretty much covered everything we will do on camera. <laughs> <laughs> Well, very good. Well, we appreciate your time. Not a problem. Uh, Let me know when you turn it off. It's off. It's on.